Alud Carbajal, U.S. Congressman, our local District 24 from California. He has been a staunch advocate for the communities of the Central Coast, including the important missions conducted day in and day out by our airmen, guardians, civilians, coalition and industry partners here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Please join me in a warm welcome for Rep the Honorable Salud Carbajal. Please welcome Congressman Salud Carbajal. Good afternoon. Listen, I understand why when folks come here, they look around and up to the sky and ask, what more can we accomplish? Because when you're here, you are already seeing the best of what the natural world has to offer. Madam Vice President, I know you're from California and that you have visited our region many, many times. So I don't need to tell you about this being paradise on earth. But by coming here, you are reaffirming the future and the importance of our nation's presence in space. As we see growing interest in space from our national security and research, science, to our commercial worlds, know that the Central Coast is working around the clock to make Vandenberg that range of the future that can support these growing industries. In Congress, I've worked with Senator Padilla and my House Armed Services colleagues to lay the groundwork for what can be a $1 trillion industry by the end of this decade. And we're getting ready for that challenge. We're getting ready for the potential doubling of launch rates over the next five years. And we're getting ready if, if and when Space Force calls to make Vandenberg the new headquarters of Starcom. When I travel throughout the communities near here, I not only see how strategically perfect Vandenberg is for this and other missions, because of how geographically close it already is to cutting edge aerospace technologies. Not to mention, some of the world's top research universities are located here as well. I also see how ensuring Vandenberg remain a leader in space operations will create good paying jobs and bring important investments to folks here on the ground and across the Central Coast. I know everyone here had a chance today to see how Vandenberg can and will be a leader in the 21st century space operations. Thank you again, Vice President Harris, for joining us today to see our little slice of paradise and to see that the future of America's space operations is here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Thank you. Please welcome Senator Alex Padilla. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is great to be here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Uh, I, too, want to thank Vice President Harris for coming here to highlight our national commitment to diplomacy in outer space, as well as California's long-standing leadership in aerospace technology and innovation. For decades, the United States has pioneered space technology as well as exploration. We've established important partnerships around the globe as well as international norms when it comes to space. And in the process, we've created tens of thousands of good paying jobs, many right here in the state of California. You know, when uh, I was earning my mechanical engineering degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I worked for a brief time in the aerospace industry. And now, as your United States Senator, I'm proud to advocate for the many Californians who work in the space sector. And that includes service members right here at Vandenberg, who oversee our nuclear defenses, 
host civil and commercial launches, and integrate new technologies from the private sector. So let me just take a moment to uh, thank the women and men who work here at Vandenberg. Thank you all for your service. Now, Vandenberg is the most used launch sites on the West Coast, a hub for space and missile testing. In fact, Vandenberg, along with Cape Canaveral in Florida, have hosted more than 97% of orbital launches in the United States over the last 65 years. And as we enter a new age of civil and commercial space exploration, California will continue to lead the way. Our domestic launch capacity is critical after all. Yes to national security, but also to scientific research, as well as our nation's economic growth. And I'm committed to continuing to work with all of our great partners, including Representative Carvajal, to maintain California's leadership in the space industry. And today, I'm especially grateful for the support of the Biden-Harris administration on this critical agenda for the Central Coast, for California, and for the United States of America. Thank you all so very much. Please welcome Commander, United States Space Command, General James Dickinson. Vice President Harris, Secretary Hicks, Senator Padilla, Congressman Carvajal, Congressman Lay, ladies and gentlemen, Today at Vandenberg Space Force Base, we stand in a place with a rich joint history. Vandenberg started out as the Army's Camp Cook, where infantry and armor soldiers trained during World War II. Then Vandenberg spent several decades as an Air Force Base, and now today it is assigned to our newest service, the United States Space Force. So today, we are building on that joint legacy to include our allies and our interagency industry and academic mission partners. And as a result, Vandenberg, Vandenberg is now an epicenter of the U.S. Space Command's joint combined partner approach to operations in space. That's why it's most appropriate that the Vice President chose Vandenberg for her visit today. This joint combined and partner team is a proud example of our stewardship of space and the benefits it brings to all humanity. And we will continue to meet and exceed Secretary Austin's initiative to establish and model the tenets of responsible behavior in space. In executing the Secretary's initiative, the Department of Defense and the United States Space Command in particular will continue to build upon years of experience in ensuring and maintaining the safety, security, stability, and sustainability of the domain. The value of satellite communications, position navigation timing, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and missile warning capabilities to join operations demands that we, make, that we meet that very objective. So we will continue to be leaders in this regard, operating in space in a professional manner. We will limit the generation of long-lived debris and avoid the creation of harmful interference. We will conduct operations consistent with the principles of maintaining safe separation and safe trajectories. And we will communicate and collaborate in enhancing the safety and security of space. It is well known that space is no longer a benign operating environment, but it need not be a hostile operating environment. That is the imperative behind U.S. Space Command's efforts to uphold the tenets of responsible behavior in space. It is the impetus behind improving our ability to maintain awareness in outer space so that we can identify and attribute aggressive or irresponsible behaviors and protect and defend against adversary threats. Those of you here at Vandenberg will continue to play a big part in that effort, adding to the rich history of joint service that you and your predecessors have built. Thank you for your outstanding contributions to our nation's defense, 
and for helping us to achieve U.S. Space Command's vision of never a day without space. Madam Vice President, this team stands ready to make the comprehensive framework and ambitious agenda for space that you outlined when, you, when sharing the National Space Conference Council last December, as it's not just a goal, but a reality. Thank you very much. Please welcome Chief of Space Operations, United States Space Force, General John J. Raymond. Good afternoon. It's, a, it's great to be back on the central coast of California. Representative Carvajal, Senator Padilla, Representative Liu, Deputy Secretary of Defense Hicks, and Vice President Harris, thank you for joining us at Vandenberg Space Force Base on this historic day. The United States is the world leader in space, and Vandenberg has long played a critical role. The first polar orbiting satellite was launched here in 1958. The first GPS satellite was launched here in 1978. The world's first commercial spaceport started operations here in 1996. Space operations training and education for the United States Space Force begins here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. And Vandenberg is the home for our command and control hub, ensuring all joint and coalition warfighters have the space capabilities they need to accomplish their missions. Today, Space is essential to the daily lives of every American and billions of people around the world. Space power enhances every instrument of our national power and underwrites the design of our joint force. However, the distinct advantage America derives from space has not gone unnoticed by our competitors and adversaries. Legacy space systems that long guaranteed security and prosperity are vulnerable. The creation of the Space Force embodies our nation's commitment to sustain our security and leadership in space. This year's President's budget request prioritizes space and enables a bold transformation to deliver resilient space capabilities to deter attack and ensure our advantage. We are doing this with our partners across the intelligence community, commercial industry, and with our allies and partners. Space has always been synonymous with the future. The guardians you see here today come to work with a singular focus on ensuring the future is bright, both here on Earth and in the heavens above. Thank you, Madam Vice President, for your leadership, for your support to guardians and their families, and for joining us here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good afternoon. I want to say a special thank you to Major General Burt, to Representative Carbala, and to Senator Padilla and to Representative Lewall, who have come to join us today. And thank you to Vice President Harris, most especially for her leadership on this incredibly important issue. Space plays a vital role in our national security. Just a few weeks ago, the Department of Defense released a 2022 National Defense Strategy Fact Sheet. That document makes clear that integrated deterrence is foundational to our strategy. Integrated deterrence entails developing and combining our strength to maximum effect by working seamlessly across warfighting domains, theaters, and spectrum of conflict. And that includes other instruments of U.S. national power and our unmatched network of alliances and partnerships. Our ability to operate in space is critical to integrated deterrence. Across sea, land, and air, the entire joint force relies on space in the conduct of our military operations. For just one example, U.S. national security satellites provide imagery, missile warning and tracking, and satellite communications. These capabilities help protect Americans at home and U.S. forces and operations overseas. And national security space capabilities 
are not just used by the military. Everyone in this audience has surely used Global Positioning System or GPS. It is a free service provided to the entire globe by the US military. Another example, Department of Defense missile warning satellites, which detect infrared heat signatures, are also used to help crews on the ground battle wildfires. Today, however, our use of space is under threat. China and Russia continue to develop, test, and proliferate sophisticated anti-satellite weapons to hold US and allied space assets at risk. Assets that help preserve safety and stability for countries around the globe. For example, Russia conducted the November 2021 anti-satellite missile test, which created over 1,500 pieces of trackable debris. The Russians then followed up with a direct threat to the GPS system that is relied upon by nations worldwide for multiple purposes. To ensure our ability to operate in space, the President's fiscal year 2023 budget request looks to invest $27.6 billion in the Defense Department's space capabilities and resilient architectures. It funds two more GPS satellites and invests in the development of secure, survivable satellite communications. And it funds the Defense Department's transition to a new resilient missile warning and missile tracking architecture. All nations on Earth benefit from space. Therefore, every nation on Earth has an interest in seeing space as safe and secure. Countries and militaries across the globe should work to enhance the sustainability, safety, security, and stability of space. Madam Vice President, your leadership on space norms is substantially advancing this goal. Thank you for your continued support and engagement on this critical national security issue. Thank you. Please welcome specialist Quinesha Davis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Specialist 4 Quinesia Davis, currently working at the Combined Space Operations Center as an Electromagnetic Interference Duty Operator. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the 49th and current Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Good afternoon. Please have a seat. Good afternoon. Thank you, Specialist Davis, for that kind introduction. It is wonderful to be back in California, and I want to thank the members of Congress who are with us today, Senator Alex Padilla, Representative Carbajal, and Representative Ted Lieu. And thank you to Deputy Secretary of Defense Hicks and the many local elected officials who are with us this afternoon. And thank you to all of you, in particular, to the United States Space Force Guardians, and the United States Space Command personnel, and to our international and commercial partners. I think everyone here recognizes how extraordinary space is. Whether it is satellites that orbit the Earth, humans that land on the moon, or telescopes that peer into the furthest reaches of the universe, Space is exciting. It spurs our imaginations. And it forces us to ask big questions. Space, it affects us all. And it connects us all. There are so many opportunities in space for our country and for all of humanity. From science to commerce, to national security. All of you on this base know the importance of the space systems that you use 
and operate and how important they are for our national security. Our space capabilities provide for global awareness, global connectivity, and global navigation. And of course, we also know the threats we face in space. This is why our administration has proposed the largest single increase in our military space capability in our nation's history. And we will continue to invest so you are able to protect our interest in space, which in turn protects our interests here on Earth. In recent months, you have heard the President and me talk a lot about defending international norms and rules. Rules and norms are shared principles that guide the behavior of people and of communities. They are common understandings of what is right, what is wrong, and what is acceptable. Whether it is the way we interact with our colleagues at work or the way nations interact with each other on the world stage, rules and norms provide us all with a sense of order and stability. As we have seen in Ukraine, Russia has completely violated the set of international rules and norms established after World War II, which provided unprecedented peace and security in Europe. In the face of Russian brutality, the world has come together to say these roles and these rules and norms must be upheld. I am heartened to see such strong affirmation of their importance. At the same time, our administration is working to establish new rules and norms for the new challenges of the 21st century. Areas like emerging technologies, cybersecurity, and of course, space. In December, I convened the first National Space Council meeting under our administration. As the chair of the council, I made this issue a point of emphasis. I believe without clear norms, we face unnecessary risks in space. The United States will continue to be a leader in order to establish, to advance, and demonstrate norms for the responsible and peaceful use of outer space. I've met with leaders from around the world, countries like Singapore and France, Iran and India, and I've raised this issue. It is clear there is strong interest among our international partners to develop these norms. We must write the new rules of the road, and we will lead by example. Today, we are taking a major step forward in this effort, a step that specifically addresses the problem of destructive missile tests in space, like the one Russia took in November. That, of course, is when Russia launched a missile to destroy a satellite in space. It is called a destructive direct ascent anti-satellite missile test. In 2007, China conducted a similar test. These tests are part of their efforts to develop anti-satellite weapons systems. These weapons are intended to deny the United States our ability to use our space capabilities by disrupting, destroying our satellites, satellites which are critical to our national security. These tests, to be sure, 
are reckless and they are irresponsible. These tests also put in danger so much of what we do in space. Here's how. When China and Russia destroyed their respective satellites, it generated thousands of pieces of debris. Debris that will now orbit our Earth for years, if not decades. I just received a briefing from the 18th Space Defense Squadron, and their work is incredibly impressive. So far, the 18th has identified more than 1,600 pieces of debris from the Russian test. There are over 2,800 pieces of debris still in space from China's test 15 years ago. Like air traffic controllers for space, the 18th tracks debris and satellites to prevent collisions. This debris presents a risk to the safety of our astronauts, our satellites, and our growing commercial presence. A piece of space debris the size of a basketball which travels at thousands of miles per hour, would destroy a satellite. Even a piece of debris as small as a grain of sand could cause serious damage. We have consistently condemned these tests and called them reckless, but that is not enough. Today we are going further. I am pleased to announce that as of today, the United States commits not to conduct destructive, direct, ascent, anti-satellite missile testing. Simply put, these tests are dangerous and we will not conduct them. We are the first nation to make such a commitment and today, on behalf of the United States of America, I call on all nations to join us. Whether a nation is spacefaring or not, we believe this will benefit everyone, just as space benefits everyone. In the days and months ahead, we will work with other nations to establish this as a new international norm for responsible behavior in space. And there is a direct connection between such a norm and the daily life of the American people. If a satellite was taken out by debris, it could affect the daily weather forecast GPS driving directions, and even your favorite television station. Critical infrastructure, like wind turbines that power our homes, well, they rely on satellites for connectivity. Satellites help us track the climate crisis. They enable our commercial activities, and they help us protect our troops and our people. All of this is threatened by the debris created by these reckless tests. These tests also threaten the lives of astronauts in the International Space Station. In fact, I spoke earlier this month with Mark van der Heij, who just returned from 355 days in space on the space station, an American record. While he was in space, Russia conducted its anti-satellite missile test. He had to shelter in an escape capsule in case the space station was hit by debris. Russia's action was a threat, not just to his life, but also to those of Russian cosmonauts. Our commitment today 
is just one step. Our administration has already begun to establish a broader and comprehensive set of norms. One example is the Artemis Accords, a set of principles that will guide civil use of space. They are designed to create a safe and transparent environment for space exploration, science, and commercial activities. Since our administration took office, we have doubled to 18 the number of nations to sign on. As we move forward, we will remain focused on writing new rules of the road to ensure all space activities are conducted in a responsible, peaceful, and sustainable manner. The United States is committed to lead the way and to lead by example. The leadership of the United States in space will continue to be a source of strength for us, both at home and abroad. And our administration, with the help of all of you here on this base, we're going to ensure future generations will benefit from space just as we have today. So thank you all again for all that you do on behalf of our country. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you.